Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Clinical Applications and Strategies Using Procalcitonin to Improve Patient Outcomes, presented by Dr. Eric Gluck, Director of Critical Services, Swedish Covenant Hospital. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Abbott. Abbott is committed to helping you live your best possible life through the power of health. For more than 125 years, they've brought new products and technologies to the world in nutrition, diagnostics, medical devices, and branded generic pharmaceuticals, all creating more possibilities for more people at all stages of life. In more than 150 countries, 94,000 Abbott team members are working to help people live not just longer, but better. And for over 40 years, Abbott has committed to delivering the highest quality products to serve our hepatitis in vitro diagnostics community. For more information, please visit abbott.com. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, notice you're viewing this presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button at the top right or use that Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the button in the bottom left-hand corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Eric Gluck. Dr. Eric Gluck received his medical degree in medicine from New York Medical College in New York. He completed his residency at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City and a pulmonary fellowship at the University of Utah School of Medicine. He currently serves as the Director of Critical Care Services and Chief Academic Officer at the Swedish Covenant Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. In addition, Dr. Gluck is a Professor of Medicine at the Finch University of Health Sciences at the Chicago Medical Center. Dr. Gluck is part of many professional societies. Most notably, he is a Fellow of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the American College of Chest Physicians, and the Chicago Institute of Medicine. He's a member of the American Thoracic Society, Alpha Omega Alpha, and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. He has presented lectures and authored many peer-reviewed articles and chapters in the field of pulmonary critical care and has been in practice for more than 20 years. More recently, Dr. Gluck has been a leader at developing and implementation strategies at his institution to reduce the risk of sepsis in critically ill patients. Join me in welcoming here today. Welcome, Dr. Gluck. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I want to thank Abbott for inviting me to talk on a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so basically, we're going to talk about the clinical applications and strategies to use a relatively new biomarker uh, to improve patient outcomes in sepsis. Um, my disclosures are that I give lectures about biomarkers for sepsis for multiple different uh, companies, but I am not an employee of any of them. Okay, so these are the contents. We're going to talk a little bit about the background uh, for biomarkers in sepsis, diagnostic tools to make us better at identifying patients and, uh, with infections. Hopefully earlier, we'll talk a little bit about how we can use these biomarkers for more appropriate usage of antibiotics. And finally, we'll end with uh, some case studies, which I think will hopefully elucidate some of the points that I'm going to make during this talk. Sepsis is a big deal. Uh, there are about 1.6 million people who are diagnosed with sepsis uh, every year translates to one every 20 seconds. In the hospitals, it is the leading cause of death. Um, when you look at causes of mortality, 
uh, and costs. Sepsis is an unbelievably significant problem. It's increasing every year. The cost of taking care of patients is increasing every year, looking at somewhere in the range of 20 to $30 billion estimate for this year or over the next three to four years. Um, so quite significant mortality rate, 21.5% uh, uh, measured about a decade ago, uh, currently estimates of about 14.7%, but that includes all forms of sepsis. Um, patients with severe sepsis and septic shock, the ones who are more likely to end up in the hospital in the intensive care unit, uh, average mortality for those patients somewhere in the high 20s to low 30%, so quite significant. But even when you think about 14.7%, that's, that's one in six to one in seven people with uh, sepsis uh, succumbing to it. So why is this a problem and, and why can't we do better? Well, first of all, we are doing a lot better. If you go back five decades when antibiotics and ICUs first became significant, the mortality rate for septic shock and severe sepsis was in the 80 to 90 percent range. So we are doing better, but why can't we do any better? The problem is, is that we have this very complex relationship with bacteria. We coexist with about 5 trillion, that's what that number works out to be, 5 trillion bacteria. We have 8 trillion cells of our own, and so there is almost as many bacteria in our body as our own personal cells. The, we have this great relationship, though, with them. The good guys help us. We, they are essential for survival. They help with digestion. They help with manufacturing certain chemicals that we can do, not do on our own. Uh, they actually protect us from more evil bacteria. And if we keep this situation in check, this is a perfectly mutual beneficial relationship. Uh, they won't harm us, we won't harm them, everyone coexists with great detente. The problem is, is that this system doesn't always stay in check, and this is not the only way that we can become infected. We don't always become infected from bacteria that are in our system. In fact, most people would have not even thought about those. Most people talk about the infections that come from outside, uh, the one you get from somebody who you're at a party and all of a sudden they cough and uh, all sorts of bacteria, viruses get uh, expelled and become uh, airborne and are potentially causing somebody else an infection. Back in the day, as we like to say, infection was based mostly on a gut feeling. Uh, Doc went up to the bedside, looked at the patient, got a couple of rudimentary lab tests, and decided that the patient was infected. The corroboration of this was very poor. There was very little objective evidence. Nobody really understood the sensitivity or specificity of white cell count, pandemia, fevers. Everyone just assumed they were very good. Uh, correlating positive cultures was very poor. Only about one in three patients with bacterial sepsis had a positive culture of any sort. And so basically, if the clinician thought you were infected, you were infected. And if you got better with antibiotics, that was a success for the antibiotics. If you didn't, then it was a failure for the antibiotics, but nonetheless, you were still infected. As it turns out, we finally learned in the 19, early 1990s that those biomarkers, the white count fever and, and bandemia, were not as specific for infections as we really had hoped they would be. The second problem with antibiotics was that they were basically prescribed by a regimen. People received antibiotics for seven days, 10 days, 14 days, and then they were stopped. So antibiotic regimens were prescribed, they weren't titrated. And, and we now understand that this is not optimal. Uh, patients present with a different load of bacteria in their body and therefore might need therapy for a different duration of time. Patients also have their own personal medical history. And as such, they may be better or worse at defending themselves against an infection. And so we need regimens that are based on response, not based on a prescribed duration. And the previous tests that we used were not able to discern how long to give antibiotics for in an individual person. The severity of an infection varies from person to person. 
most importantly, it all depends on the immunocompetency of the patient. And when I talk about immunocompetency, I'm not just talking about whether a person has a disease like leukemia or lymphoma that might adversely affect a person's ability to defend themselves against an infection. Yet we, those are part of the process. But people who have recently had an infection, their immunocompetency may not have been fully dis, uh, restored yet. Elderly patients, patients who are malnourished, patients who uh, have uh, alcoholic problems, all those patients may have a different level of immunocompetency and therefore may respond to an infection differently. How long it takes for the patient to present to a healthcare provider uh, may also change the severity. So a pneumonia could be very easy to treat if the patient presents early on, much more difficult if he or she waits at home for three or four days because the size of the bacterial burden will vary. And this will vary depending on how long the patient takes to present, how, the, how many bacteria the patient initially got infected with, and how well the, their own immune system can defend itself. Obviously, the site of infection is important. There are certain areas of the body where infections are relatively routine and the body can handle them. That would be the GI tract. There are other places where the body can't handle them at all. That would be the cerebral spinal fluid area. So meningitis and encephalitis are very bad. Uh, pneumonia is somewhere in between. And, of course, we already talked about the nutritional and functional status as being very, very important uh, in how well somebody could defend themselves against an infection. So the duration of antibiotic therapy should be dictated by response. So we, we need something to tell us what this response is. Um, we also now know that white cells and the other biomarkers that we used are not s sensitive nor specific enough to clearly identify all the patients who have infection and those patients who don't have infection. In fact, one of the criteria that we use, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, SERS criteria, it turns out two-thirds of the patients have these criteria, uh, but only 25% of patients in the ICU uh, are infected. So how does the body know when there's an infection going on? Well, this is a depiction of the cell. Um, and over here is the cell wall, and on the cell wall we have these receptors. They're sort of like antenna fluttering in the fluid between our cells, the interstitial fluid, and they're looking for bacteria, living bacteria, dead bacteria, parts of bacteria, innards of bacteria. And they, there are actually 12 of these receptors Eight of them are external, four of them are internal. They will respond by creating a biochemical reaction when they encounter a bacteria. This whole idea is to turn this cell into a bacteria fighting machine, but also to warn other, ba other cells in the neighborhood that they are under attack. So they send out a signal to other cells nearby, and that's where these inflammatory cytokines uh, come as you can see over here. Uh, that's where they, they come into uh, play. These will respond and they will do things inside the cell to turn it into a killing machine and also leak out of the cell and go to other cells to tell uh, the other cells that there is an invading bacteria in the neighborhood. Now, the problem that the body has is that we have bacteria throughout our body in different situations. We already talked about these guys over here. These are called commensal bacteria. These are the guys who are our friends. And as long as they are in the right numbers, in the right place, they really can't do us any harm. In fact, they help. Uh, the only time they could become problematic is if we change the environment and that allows them to grow out of proportion to what they should. When that happens or if the barrier to that uh, is changed, like you see over here, well, then they can actually invade our body and cause us an infection. Uh, you may have had a friend or family member or know about C. difficile infections. C. difficile is a bacteria that's in our colon and typically does us no harm, 
unless the environment in the colon is changed and then it, it can become a devastating infection. And you can see that the body's response to this is prorated. Now, of course, we have these pathogens that can get into us. Uh, some of them are very weak. They require some additional change in the environment to cause an infection. Uh, and then we also, so those are the facultative pa pathogens. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of people think that those are the ones that are the uh, bacteria that people encounter in the IC ICU and stuff like that. Those are the bacteria that require a debilitated host for them to get going. The pathogens over here are the ones that you could get by riding next to somebody on a train or a bus and they cough on you. And so sometimes we sort of treat those because they're so easy to get outside the hospital as less important than the ones that you get inside the hospital, but nothing could be further from the truth. And again, you can see that the response of the body to these bacteria is significantly different than the previous responses. And, and again, there is this dose-response curve. The body recognizes initially just a little bit of cell wall, and then there is this response that is limited. If they see dead bacteria, then the response starts to increase. If they see live bacteria, then you can see that the response is really quite robust. And then when you have these pathogens that can produce toxins as well, then the response is really quite dramatic. So the body understands this. And what we need to do to really understand when there's an infection is to tap into this resource. There is an infection when the body thinks there is an infection. And so if we could look into these chemical responses and find one of them that we could measure easily and accurately, that would help us identify an infection when the body thought there was an infection. Because when there is an infection, as you can see here, the bacteria excites these pathways that I talked about on the cells, and a whole chemical reaction occurs, leaking stuff out of the cell and causing further proteins to be made in the nucleus. And these responses are very, very specific to the bacteria. So not only do we know that there's a bacterial infection, but the body sort of knows which bacteria it is that is causing the infection. In addition there, to this nuclear response is, as you can see on this slide here, the release. Now, the release of these substances basically is what gives you the fever, the chills, the elevation in the white count, the change in cardiac function. All of those changes are there in an attempt to defend against an infection. The problem is that those same chemicals, to some degree, are released whether there's a bacterial infection or whether there's inflammation, as is depicted over here. So here, when there's inflammation, we get the same response. And so initially, the body doesn't discern the difference between a sterile inf inflammation and a bacterial inflammation. In fact, it responds just like the fire department does. If you pull the fire alarm, the, fi the fire guy gets on the phone, he doesn't ask you what kind of fire it is. He doesn't ask you if it's a big fire, a small fire, electrical fire, gas fire, or anything like that. He just says, where's the fire? And they send everybody there. And once they figure out what's going on, they will decide who needs to participate and who does not. Well, that's exactly what the body does. Whether there's sterile inflammation or bacterial infection, the body responds as if it was a bacterial infection because that's the thing that can do it the most harm. And that's why a fever, a white count, an elevation uh, in band count are nonspecific because the body responds to that whether there's an infection or not. So once again, what we're trying to do is tap into these biochemical pathways because those are the ones that are much more specific for an infection. So, as I was saying, the, the immune system doesn't always differentiate between sepsis and damage. One, because it's a bad evolutionary mistake to allow bacteria to reproduce rapidly 
without defending against it. And number two, uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference if we waste some resources initially. Eventually, we can get a signal that it's much more sig sig uh, specific and sensitive. So what are we going to do to tap into this? Well, initially, procalcitonin was identified as a pro precursor to calcitonin, which lowers serum calcium after a calcium load that you might get from eating a meal that's rich in dairy products. As it turns out, procalcitonin has a, pr a, a use that is much more significant and actually predated this. It is one of those chemicals released by the body, by the cells, specifically in response to bacteria. It does not respond to viruses. It does not respond to protozoa. It doesn't respond to any other infecting agents except bacteria and some fungi which have been able to fool our body into thinking they're really a bacteria. So for all intents and purposes, this procalcitonin signal identifies with high degree of sensitivity and specificity bacteria, bacterial infections. It has been demonstrated over the last two and a half decades to, to give us a dose response to the severity of infections. When the infections are very localized, the levels are just modestly elevated. Less than 0.1 is considered normal. So in local infections, you almost cannot discern a signal because the levels are so close to normal as they would be very difficult statistically to uh, discern that. As the local infection spreads and becomes more significant, uh, the levels will become clearly elevated. Most people consider 0.50 to be clearly elevated. And then as you progress to sepsis and severe sepsis and then ultimately septic shock, the levels get higher and higher. So not only is this a signal of infection. It, it also is a signal of the severity of the infection. And it is a signal of severity of infection not based on what the clinician sees in the patient, but based on what the body perceives is going on. And the body is a much better observer than the clinician. Now, you have to understand the kinetics of this biomarker to understand how to use it. There are other cytokines, we talked about them in general, that are produced during an infection. Uh, IL-6, IL-10, and TNF are prepackaged in the cell, and they are released virtually immediately, as you can see here. Uh, the timeline, they go up almost immediately to a level that is detectable. Procalcitonin and the other biomarker, CRP, they don't go up right away. There is a delay. So it is possible for a patient to actually present early in sepsis and have a normal PCT level or CRP. So we need to get two levels of PCT at least six hours apart in order to be sure that the levels are negative. But here's the beauty of PCT. Unlike the other biomarkers that we talked about, IL-6 will disappear very rapidly, as will IL-10 and TNF, which means if the patient presents late, it may not have a signal that we can see anymore. So PCT and CRP become signals that start a little bit later, but last as long as the patient's infected. And so they become very useful in identifying patients with sepsis. In this chart here, we did a sensitivity and specificity analysis of the different biomarkers. Uh, here we used procalcitonin, C-reactive protein, IL-6, and lactate. Now, let's dispel with lactate. Lactate is a wonderful biomarker, although it looks poor in this study, and that's because lactate is not specific for infection. Lactate is specific for perfusion defects. So when a patient has 
simple perfusion of organs, the lactate level goes up. That may be sepsis, but it could also be heart failure. It could also be trauma. And so that's why it didn't show great sensitivity and specificity. As you can see here, IL-6 and uh, CRP did pretty well. CRP had the problem in that it is also slightly less specific because it will go up in sterile inflammation. Of the biomarkers that were tested, PCT had the best receiver operating characteristics. So it had the best sensitivity and the best specificity. Okay, we talked about all these different kinds of descriptions of infection. Just to go into a historical perspective, back in the day, people finally understood that those biomarkers that we're talking about um, are not as specific as we thought they were for infection. And so Dr. Bone, in an article that was published in 1991, came up with the concept of SIRS. The inflammatory response syndrome, which if there is an infection present, denotes sepsis. If there is no infection present, denotes sterile inflammation. So basically, not all patients who have an elevated white count, fever, bandemia, low blood pressure, tachycardia, tachypnea, are infected. If they are, then they have sepsis. If they are infected and they have organ failure, we call that severe sepsis. If they have low blood pressure and elevated lactate levels, we call that septic shock. This has recently been modified uh, last year, I guess it was 2016, and they changed it a little bit to make it more specific, they thought, and sensitive. Uh, and so the SERS criteria are left out because SERS doesn't denote infection. Infection denotes infection. Um, infection in organ damage is now con considered to be sepsis. And then infection, organ failure with low blood pressure and or an elevated lactate level uh, denotes septic shock. And the big difference in the lactate level between the older uh, and newer criteria is the level. In the older criteria, it was 4.5 millimoles, and now it's 2 millimoles. In reality, though, these are nice for classification and for identification of risk. But what the most important thing is not that to a clinician is, is the guy infected? Does he have sepsis? And sadly, neither of these two schemes tell us that. We have to figure that out for ourselves, and one of the ways to figure that out for ourselves is to measure biomarkers. In the new criteria, and I'm not going to belabor this, we use specific criteria for organ failure to denote um, sepsis uh, so that everyone will be on the same page when they're identifying organ failure. This is the sequential organ failure assessment or the SOFR scale, and that's how we identify that. Okay. What about the newer guidelines with respect to identification and usage of antibiotics in patients with infections. So for the longest time in the United States, we lagged behind our European brethren. They had been using biomarkers for antimicrobial stewardship as well as identification for sepsis for at least a decade before we got going. But finally now, in the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines for 2016, we can see that the expert panel believes that the measurement of procalcitonin levels can be used to support shortening the duration of antimicrobial therapy. What does that mean? It means that we can now titrate antibiotics to a specific patient and infection as opposed to just some global algorithm that is supposed to be okay for everybody, which we know it's not. Most importantly, when the levels become very low, they now suggest that we can use those levels to discontinue empiric therapy. So if we started the patient on therapy, we now can look at sequential procalcitonin levels, and when they become very low, typically 90% of peak level, 
we can stop them. In addition, we can use um, negative PCT levels to avoid the use of antibiotics in people who are not infected. And we can also use them to decide when patients who are infected are not responding appropriately to therapy. So typically procalcitonin has a half-life of about 24 hours. And so if we're treating a patient appropriately, this biomarker should disappear by 50% every day. If it does not, it would suggest that there might be an infection that we're not treating adequately. Again, they recommended the use of this biomarker uh, for treating patients with hospital-associated infections and ventilator-associated infections. So there were separate uh, papers dealing with just infections in general and then uh, H caps and, and VAPs as well. So current guidelines, management of patients with hospital-acquired and ventilator-associated pneumonias, we can use it to discontinue antibiotic therapy. We can also do it to implement an antibiotic stewardship program so that we can overall reduce patient exposures to antibiotics. And it, they are now, uh, when we look into the Critical Care Society, finally in 2017, they have approved the use of procalcitonin in their surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. Again, reiterating what the IDSA had said, shortening the duration of antibiotics, and for the discontinuation of antibiotics, especially in circumstances where we've never actually been able to culture the organism from the patient. So most of the time, um, procalcitonin is used as a corroboration for infection, but typically clinicians will start antibiotics uh, even before the levels come back and even if the levels initially are negative uh, because of the fact that they can lag 6 to 12 hours be until after presentation for a patient. However, when the PCT is negative two times and these measurements are taken at least 12 hours apart, typically they're done every day, so not 12 hours apart, just once a day, then uh, antibiotics are typically discouraged in typical protocols. And data has suggested that it is a, a very reasonable clinical thing to do. Besides telling us when to stop antibiotics, procalcitonin can also help us prognosticate so that we can understand whether patients are going to do well or poorly. This was a paper that I, I authored uh, with Philip Schutz and others where we looked at the decline in procalcitonin levels and as a function of survival. And what we found was that when the levels declined at 72 hours by 80% from what they were at their highest, the mortality rate for severe sepsis and septic shock was only 10%. If the procalcitonin levels did not decline by 80% under those circumstances, the mortality rate was 33%. So it was three times higher when the PCT levels did not decline. This was the basis for the MOSES study, some of the data I will be showing you here. But I just wanted to go through some other data to show the benefit of procalcitonin in the American literature over the last decade. These are multiple different studies uh, where we looked at either discontinuing or continuing antibiotics with lower respiratory tract infections based on PCT levels. And so here what you can see is that in the vast majority of these studies, PCT demonstrated a benefit. Here's a one of the exceptions. This study over here by Christofferson uh, did not show a benefit, but all the other studies uh, did show a benefit for procalcitonin. Uh, this was a study that also, uh, I, I possibly should have presented this before now, uh, basically, it's basically 
tells us why we cannot necessarily wait for the procalcitonin levels to become positive to start antibiotics. Because what this study showed was that once the patient presents to the emergency room, there is a 7% increase in mortality, relative 7%. The mortality rate only goes up by 7% of what the patient would have been. So if the, if the mortality rate for that patient was 20%, it, it goes up by 1.4%. But it does that every hour. And so we cannot afford to delay administering antibiotics. But if the PCT levels come back negative, we will DC the antibiotics typically at 24 hours. So early recognition of sepsis is really important in order to improve the outcomes for these patients. But sometimes patients will present with elevated procalcitonin levels in whom somebody did not expect the patient to have an infection. Okay, so this is a, a, a sepsis algorithm that was promoted by uh, the Moses uh, trial. Uh, so patients who were diagnosed with severe sepsis or septic shock, um, they looked at the change in PCT levels over the first four days. If the levels changed by less than 80%, the patient had a high mortality rate risk. If the PCT levels changed by more than 80%, there was a lower. So this was the Moses trial. This is the trial that got the FDA to uh, increase the uh, uh, statements that could be used about procalcitonin and use it, increase its use clinically. Um, we can look at some additional studies that show that PCT guidance significantly reduces the duration of exposure to antibiotics for patients with sepsis. Uh, so this, this was a, a meta-analysis, and you can see that using these cutoff levels, uh, you can actually significantly reduce exposure without increasing adverse events. Obviously, that would be an importance. Uh, this was for everybody on antibiotics, and you can see that the antibiotic exposure starting at day three was statistically significant, and it stayed significant till uh, uh, almost a month later. These are data from um, randomized controlled trials that show that there was no adverse association with reducing antibiotic exposures under those circumstances. So you can see that although they were, patients were exposed significantly less antibiotics, there was no increased mortality. Can we use this around the hospital? Yeah, uh, this study showed that you can get the benefit uh, if you use it in the ED, any place in the hospital uh, gives you a similar benefit. Uh, in community acquired pneumonia, um, there was a benefit, acute exacerbations of COPD, possibly one of the most significant benefits. These patients always have cough. A lot of them have chronic sputum production, and then they get short of breath. It is so difficult clinically to identify whether there's an infection. So these patients receive antibiotics typically five to seven days, and we knew that only half of these patients actually had bacterial infections. We just didn't know from the get-go. Well, procalcitonin, this biomarker can actually help us identify that, and you can see the dramatic reduction in antibiotic exposure in acute exacerbations of COPD, which is still one of the most prevalent things that we see in emergency departments. Okay. Uh, sorry about the, I, I don't know if you see that yellow thing there. You weren't supposed to. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, PCT in my hospital. I was an early adapter. I, I did this because so many patients were coming up from the emergency department on an, in antibiotics, and my colleagues wanted to con continue them, but I could not see that the patient had an infection. So we were looking for something that would help us, and so we became an early adapter. Uh, so we've been using it. Uh, this slide is actually a little old. It's now nine years. Uh, and we, we draw about 200 PCT levels a, a, a month. And it used to be solely in the ICU, but now it's used in the emergency department as well as on the general medical floors. Okay, so that, those are the introductory remarks. 
I know, I know that took up a good portion of the hour, but we're going to go through some some cases. These are not really exciting, sexy cases, but they do demonstrate how to use the biomarker. Okay, so first patient presents nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Did some liver function tests. They're abnormal. They were obstructed. Uh, people are believing that this patient has ascending cholangitis. Patient's elevated. No left shift. Lipase was normal, which helped rule out the possibility of pancreatitis. So the patient gets resuscitated with some fluids. Um, antibiotics are start, started. Cultures are obtained. And, of course, we're not going to get results on these cultures because we don't do PCRs at our hospital, probably for 48, maybe 72 hours. So let's do some biomarker evaluations. Okay, so this is what the biomarker evaluation looked like. On the initial presentation, you can see that the uh, PCT was initially 0.2. It was low. And the lactate level was elevated. Okay, so based on the presentation, would we suggest that antibiotics are working on this patient or not? Why don't you guys respond now, and I think I will get a real-time poll. And how long after the onset of antibiotic beginning should we dis discontinue the antibiotics? Uh, and I guess the choices that you have in front of you are from day one to day five. So if you guys could submit that, and then we'll go on and see what happens. Okay. So initially, the PCT level is negative. The lactate level is high. And as we resuscitate the patient, we see that the lactate level disappears pretty quickly. So you can see that within a half a day, that's what 0.5 that it means, the lactate level returns to normal. So right now at 12 hours into our hospitalization, we have a negative PCT and we have a normalization of lactate. Now, 86% of you guys wanted to continue antibiotics because you thought they were working, and, and I think that's quite a reasonable conclusion. And about half of you uh, wanted to continue antibiotics for at least five days. Uh, the other half actually pretty aggressive in discontinuing the antibiotics. But look what happens on day one. So 24 hours after the patient's in the hospital, we actually repeat the PCT, and now look at it. It's 10. Despite the fact that lactate level has normalized, but of course the lactate and PCT are looking at different things. Procalcitonin is looking at whether the body thinks it's infected. Lactate is looking at whether you fixed perfusion, and you did. Perfusion is great. Infection still ongoing. This will stay elevated until we get adequate antibiotic levels in the tissues to force the body's response to, to get rid of the bacteria. And so, in fact, you can see here that the PCT levels are actually the same 48 hours later. But now you can see on day three, there was about a 50% reduction. On day four, a 50% reduction. And on day five, a even greater reduction. And so, those of you who thought that stopping antibiotics on day five would be a great idea, that would be okay. And in fact, one could argue that day four might be just a little bit too early because there's only an, a, about an 80%, a little bit less than 80% decline there. But now you can see the difference between the two biomarkers. One is talking about the adequacy of perfusion. One is the adequacy of infection control. Uh -oh. Okay. So, not to belabor the point, uh, we gave the patients antibiotics. Resuscitation made the patient significantly better. The patient actually had a great outcome. 
Okay, so now I have two cases, um, which I call case two scenario one and case two scenario two, because the two patients presented almost at the same time, four hours apart. They had almost the same history, but quite different clinical outcomes. So the first patient was a female with shortness of breath, some hypoxia, patchy infiltrates on the chest x-ray. The white count was elevated. There was a little bit of a shift to the left. She had some sputum production, no subjective fever. Okay, so now we get some biomarkers, and the biomarkers demonstrate to us on day one that the patient has a negative PCT and a positive lactate level. Okay, well, still could be pneumonia. Seems like it might be heart failure based on the x-ray and clinical scenario, but can't not treat her at least initially because the infiltrates and the elevated white count for a pneumonia. We're going to allow the PCT to help us identify what is really going on in this patient. And so, 24 hours later, we repeat the PCT, and you can see that it's 4.2. I'm, I'm sorry, the lactate level is 4.2. The PCT is negative. Okay, so we have now two PCT levels that are pristine, 24 hours apart, probability of infection less than 2%, Stop antibiotics. Lactate levels elevated. This patient's in heart failure. So this patient does not need antibiotic therapy. This patient needs therapy for her heart. Okay, same presentation. It was another woman, a few years younger, nonetheless, basically with the same story, almost identical chest x-rays. Difference was the sputum did show a, a little bit of sputum production. And so we're going to poll again here. Uh, first, what would this pattern indicate when we look at it? Initially, we have a negative PCT and a positive lactate, but at 24 hours, we now have a positive PCT, and the lactate has improved. So would this suggest a bacterial infection, a viral infection, a pneumonia, or do we still need additional workup? If you guys could vote now, that would be great. Okay. The second question that I'm going to ask about this, does this patient have severe sepsis? This one's easy, either yes or no, and you guys could respond to that one as well. Okay, well, this patient was started on antibiotics, and you can see that there is a nice decline in PCT over time. And this indicates to us that the patient has had a, an appropriate response. At this point in time, the patient was transferred out of the ICU, but still on antibiotics. There, 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 was, there, there was still significant infection present so we did not stop antibiotics. But here is the beauty of this. These two patients had almost the exact same clinical history. The chest x-rays were almost indistinguishable. One of them had just heart failure. One of them had pneumonia. One needed antibiotics and got it. The other one didn't need antibiotics and only got antibiotics for 24 hours. Let's see how you guys did. Okay, we all identified that this patient uh, had a bacterial infection. Uh, and we did quite well there. About 66% of you guys thought that, uh, and 61% uh, said the patient had severe sepsis, and that would be correct because the patient actually had uh, septic shock because the lactate level was elevated and the patient did have an infection. So good, good work. Nicely done. Maybe you could teach my fellows that. Okay, case three, two-day history of diarrhea and fever. The patient had recently undergone a revision of hip surgery. The patient was exposed to antibiotics for 48 hours to prevent post-op infection. She presents with a normal white count, but with a left shift, a temperature to 101, and a heart rate of 107. So she has all the service criteria and some criteria to make us think that she might be infected. Abdomen was distended and tender. She had dilation of the small bowel, 
we are now suspecting that this might be an antibiotic-induced C. difficile overgrowth and infection. And in fact, these are the PCT levels that you will now see. Initially, she presented with a PCT level of 16, way high. I mean, less than 0.1 is normal, so this is uh, very significantly elevated, 160 times normal. Okay. The lactate level was okay. It was one. It was not abnormal at all. The patient has started on antibiotic therapy for C. diff, and the white count goes up to 89,000. I'm sorry. The, the, the PCT goes up to 89. This is okay. For 24 hours after appropriate therapy, the PCT can rise, and it will rise to the level that is commensurate with how sick the patient really is. Okay, so it went to 89. This is a pretty sick person. If you remember that dose response curve that I showed you early in the lecture, uh, this person's way up there. But we do see that there is a response. It goes down to 64, then it goes down by half, but then over here, it only goes down uh, by about a third, and then here it goes down only by a quarter, and actually here it's going up. This should never happen. We were very concerned right between day five and day six. When the PCT is not responding appropriately, something bad is happening. The patient ended up having a perforation with massive peritonitis, swelling of her abdominal space. The infection became overwhelming with multiple different organisms. And then you can see on day eight, the level went up to 199, and finally 299, and sadly the patient expired. Okay. Uh, last case, um, this is a patient who presented with uh, urosepsis. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, just a rehash of the previous case. Okay, here we go. Uh, we have a patient with urosepsis. Symptoms were frequency and dysuria. Um, urinalysis was positive. White cells, bacteria, leukocyte esterase, nitrates were positive. Okay, so we bring the patient into the intensive care unit because, as you can see, the lactate level was very significantly elevated, and that would put the patient in the septic shock range, okay? And so uh, we resuscitate the patient. Next day, the PCT didn't go down very much, but as I pointed out, um, this is okay. Uh, this does not necessarily mean a treatment failure. Uh, lactate, as you can see, did respond very nicely, but here's the problem. At 48 hours, the PCT should be declining by 50%, and it's not. And so the things we consider here, did we miss the appropriate infection? Maybe this was a urinary tract infection. We're treating it with the incorrect antibiotics. Or is there a protected source? Is this an abscess? Is there some reason that my antibiotics cannot get to where their bacteria are to kill them? Uh, the, the levels go up even further on day four. We get an ultrasound, and we find that this is a protected focus. We find an abscess in her ki uh, kidney. So there was a perinephric abscess. We sent her down to interventional radiology. The patient's abscess was drained, and we bring her back to the ICU afterwards. And I guess for some reason I am not getting the slide which would demonstrate that, that the patient uh, had a very nice, oh, no, no, we're not getting that slide. I, I apologize. What would have happened on the next slide would have been that the patient had demonstrated a very nice response to antibiotic therapy with a decline in PCT of about 50% a day until uh, the abscess was completely drained and the infection was completely gone. So to summarize, what we have now for the first time is a biomarker which doesn't look at the macro response of the body 
to inflammation and or infection, but is a very specific cellular response to the presence of bacteria in the environment. And this response increases uh, in response to the intensity of the infection so that it can tell you how sick the patient is uh, at presentation. When the antibiotic therapy is successful, the signal disappears with a half-life of about 24 hours, and so that you can actually monitor the response to know whether your response is effective. So you don't have to rely on uh, the fever curve, which may be difficult to interpret because of uh, antipyretics, or the white count, which always was difficult to interpret because it seemed to disappear way faster than the patient was getting better. We can titrate antibiotic therapy specifically to the response of this patient. And then finally, if you think the guy's infected but the procalcitonin levels are negative times two, at least spaced by 12 hours, then your impression probably was incorrect. And you can stop antibiotics right then and there. So we now have a tool that can help us look into what the body is responding to, how they're responding, how appropriately we are treating them, not from external signals, but from internal signals. Thank you for your attention, uh, and I would be more than happy to handle any questions that may have arisen during this talk. Dr. Gluck, thank you so much for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look at our questions from our audience members now. Dr. Gluck, our first question coming in is, what is the protocol or clinical algorithm that you currently use your practice to manage sepsis patients? So if we have a patient uh, who presents with a reasonable clinical history of sepsis, the protocol is to do adequate fluid resuscitation, uh, draw procalcitonin levels, and start the culture of the patient, uh, and then start the patient on antibiotics using an empiric regimen based on the site of the infection. We then do serial procalcitonin measurements uh, to, one, identify whether, in fact, this was an infection, and the response. So if we have two negative PCTs, then we actually discontinue antibiotic therapy. The pharmacist at our hospital will go around, will evaluate and look at the PCT levels, and if they are negative, they will put a stop order in antibiotics. If they're positive, they'll keep the antibiotics going until the PCT levels are less than 90% of what they were at their peak. We use this protocol in the ICU and also on the general medical floors. Uh, we also use this protocol for the early identification uh, of sepsis in our patients. So in the event that the nurse has a patient who white cell count comes back elevated on a CBC or the patient develops a fever or tachycardia or other signs or symptoms of an infection, the nurse on the floor has the ability to order a CBC, a lactate level, and a procalcitonin level so that these data can be acquired more rapidly so that when the physician arrives at the bedside to help evaluate this patient with the nurse, uh, these data are uh, readily available and better clinical decisions can be made. Thank you, Dr. Gluck. And here's our next question from our audience. How has implementation of PCT improved patient outcomes? So two things, one that is published, one that is not yet published. The first thing that's published is, well, we found out that we're using a lot less antibiotics, and we figured out why. We're using a lot less antibiotics because we have a huge number of people who are started on antibiotics but are stopped at 24 hours when the PCT levels are negative five years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago, that could not have happened. 
those patients probably would have gotten the full course of antibiotics, mostly because a negative culture doesn't mean the patient's not infected. So they would have gotten the antibiotics. So we, we are, we're down probably about 50 to 55% in our antibiotic usage. Number two, data that we are now accumulating and should have ready for publication shortly is our C. diff rate has gone down significantly. Um, in the ICU, we were getting on average 15 to 18 uh, cases per year of C. diff. We're down to four. Um, and the initial analysis demonstrates that there is a significant correlation with the C. diff in patients who have gotten serial PCT levels and in those patients who had antibiotics stopped. So these data will, will be ready for publication very shortly. Thank you, Dr. Gluck. And thank you, audience member. We have a wonderful, active audience today. Our next question is, any, are there any correlation between PCT levels and G-negative and G-positive orga organisms as the source of sepsis? So it um, turns out PCT responds more vigorously in gram-negative organisms only because the cell responds more aggressively, for whatever reason, to gram-negative. The, the cell has the toll receptors. That is equal for both gram-positive and gram-negatives. But there is, in addition, an, a lipopolysaccharide receptor on the cells, and LPS is only from gram negative. So there are a there is another set of receptors on the cells just for gram negatives. And both of those will stimulate PCT production. So there seems to be a more vigorous response to gram negatives than gram positives. GI infections have the highest response as far as levels. Uh, pneumonia in between, uh, urinary tract and skin the lowest. So it is dependent also on the immunocompetency of the tissue. Uh, and since the GI tract is, has to be tremendously immunocompetent because of all the bacteria that are nearby, uh, it's not surprising that that has the biggest response. Thank you so much. And here's our next question. How do you explain the negative PCT levels at day one for all three patients cases presented, considering that a rapid increase would be expected? So I specifically picked those, those uh, cases as a teaching point. What I don't want people to think is that a single negative PCT level means there is no infection. And so I only picked cases where the PCT level uh, is negative at presentation. However, uh, over the course of the nine years that we've been using it and other people have recorded the exact same results. In an average hospital, uh, community type hospital, about one third of your patients will present with a negative PCT level. Two thirds will present with a positive one at the, uh, when they come to the ED or to the ICU or whatever. So although it would appear from my slide presentation that that was the universal situation, it actually is the minority of situations. But it does help me make my teaching point, which I think is a very important one, that in order to exclude an infection, you need two PCT levels at least 12 hours apart. Thank you, Dr. Luck. And here's a related question. During early, the early part of your presentation, when you were trying to confirm whether bacterial infections exist but PCT levels are still low, how often would you recommend testing PCT during the first 24 hours? Uh, we, since the person is going to get antibiotics no matter what, on the first dose, and since the beauty of antibiotics now is that they have such a long half-life and we don't have to give very many, of, uh, very many doses of them, I only measure the PCT every 24 hours. Now, theoretically, there might be a circumstance where you might want to do 
one at 12 hours. Let's suppose you had a patient with meningitis and you really needed to know whether it's bacterial or viral and the first PCT was negative because the mom brought the baby in, for instance, let's say very early. Um, that might be a circumstance uh, where you might want to test more often than once a day. But since the half-life is 24 hours, once you've established that the person is infected, you do not need to, to test PCT any more often than once a day. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for our active participation. Our next question comes from across the world. Is there an advantage to initiating antibiotic treatment for a patient presenting with elevated IL-6? Um, if one could get IL-6 and PCT levels, there would be. But IL-6 is a relatively nonspecific inflammatory mediator as well. If, for instance, you had a trauma to your leg, your IL-6 levels would be elevated whether or not there was an infection. But if the IL-6 levels were elevated and you were waiting for the PCT levels to become positive, at least that would tell you that there was some degree of an inflammation in the body and that would make it more likely that antibiotics was going to be the right answer. Uh, but IL-6, TNF are very nonspecific, very similar in scope to C-reactive protein, but even more globally responsive to almost any form of inflammation, whereas C-reactive protein uh, typically responds to uh, a inflammatory pattern that is lymphocytic induced. Thank you. <clears throat> and how do you address or balance the misuse or abuse, the PCT usage from a lab point view? Well, I mean, the big deal about abuse of any lab test is the cost. Fortunately, the cost is very small. Second, lab time. Um, the test is automated, um, so it's not a big deal uh, as far as extra lab time. So here's the point. If a patient's on antibiotics, then there is absolutely no good reason not to do PCT levels. At worst, they'll corroborate you're doing the right thing. At best, they'll say, oh, this patient doesn't need antibiotics, or this patient, you can stop the antibiotics today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow or the day after. Uh, and the cost of the test relative to a day of antibiotics uh, makes it almost a no-brainer. It's much more cost-effective to measure PCT levels serially than to use clinical judgment with antibiotics alone. And, and would stopping antibiotic therapy early based on the PCT result leading to antibiotic resistance? No, actually, we think it's just the opposite. Basically, antibiotic resistance comes from a genetic fluke. Bacteria exposed to an antibiotic, they are trying to defend themselves, they're making all these proteins, and eventually they hit the right one, and they become the dominant bacteria, and so now we have a resistant organism, if you only expose them to very short amounts of antibiotics because they are not infected, then the possibility of bac bacteria becoming resistant is actually decreased. So we think that one of the communal benefits of using this biomarker would actually be just the opposite, a reduction in the potential for resistant organisms. <clears throat> And would you recommend having PCT on every patient who presents in ER for suspected sepsis? If you are a discerning ER doc and you think that they have suspected sepsis, absolutely. It doesn't help the ER guy that much, but it helps the guy who's going to be taking care of him after he leaves the ER. I mean, if the PCT level is negative and they send him home, and the doc looks at the guy, he has to know that the PCT level was negative 
this person may have a syndrome that is mimicking an infection but is not. And if the patient's admitted, then we already have a baseline level so that we can see if the patient's responding to therapy. But as far as the decision making for the ER guy, they're still going to have to use their clinical judgment because they're only going to have a single PCT level when the patient presents. So they're going to, if the patient has a low idea, I mean, if the clinician has a low index of suspicion, then a negative PCT may be enough to stop, not to give antibiotics in the first place. If the patient has a moderate, in, you know, index of suspicion and the level's elevated, well, that's going to push that index of suspicion to very high. So, yeah, I think the ER guys need to use their clinical judgment, obviously, this will help them make better decisions. And Dr. Gluck, are there any guidelines that are recommended to use PCT in diagnosis sepsis in the ICU? Yeah, actually the original uh, guidelines from the FDA were all about ICU patients. Uh, and they have now been supplemented by the IDSA guidelines and the SCCM guidelines. Because the original guidelines did not talk about um, hospital-associated infections and ventilator-associated infections. But they did always identify patients who presented to emergency ICU in, in prognostication uh, of who was sick and who was not based on the initial levels that were obtained. Thank you. And here's another question regarding guidelines. Beside the surviving sepsis guidelines, will PCT be incorporated in any other governing guidelines, example, CDC guidelines? I do believe that since the FDA has approved this, these, these statements, that they will be part of the government guidelines. What we're waiting to see is whether the CMS guidelines Right now, the CMS guidelines tell you what you have to do in the emergency department and elsewhere when you identify a patient who might be infected. They are not part of those guidelines as of yet. Uh, lactate is. PCT is not. Uh, but those guidelines were created a year before the FDA approved these additional uh, claims for PCT. So we'll, we'll have to see. I, I think that they will be included, uh, but I can't be 100% sure. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. Um, our next question is, how does PCT use differ between an adult versus a pediatric patient population? It, it really shouldn't. Uh, neonates, that's a different story. When, pa pa when, when a baby is born, the immune system goes through very, very dramatic changes for the first 72 hours, so the guidelines there are very different. But um, the pediatric and adults should respond exactly the same. This is not something that you, that you gain uh, once you go through puberty or anything like that. Uh, studies in pediatrics have shown that it's just as useful in pediatric patients as it is in adults. Um, the only thing that's different is the type of infections that kids get um, and the levels that uh, you might consider abnormal in, in, in them. Uh, as far as I know, uh, 0.5 is still the threshold that most people use as reasonably positive to the point where the likelihood of false positive is small. So uh, I would assume they're using the same levels in pediatrics, but I don't take care of those kids, so I don't know for sure. But there. The data is very significant in that it should work just as well in kids as it does in adults. Dr. Glick, thank you again for your presentation. And audience, thank you so much for your live participation. We want to let you know that um, your further questions will be answered via email. Dr. Glick, did you want to provide the audience with any closing remarks before we close our presentation today? I think I gave a nice little summary before we did the question and answer. Uh, so, no, I'm good. I'm really uh, glad that I got the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the talk. We did, and thank you again for your presentation and your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and Abbott for making today's educational webcast possible.
Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.